partying last night. Who just slept in this room? Who just woke up and they're like, wait, where am I? Uh, how's your con been? It's been incredible. This is my first Dragon Con. <laughs> what did you say? Welcome home. Thank you. It's been phenomenal. I mean, I know that apparently we're only at like half the usual size, but that is fine by me. It's, um, I mean, I'm just, I'm amazed. I keep getting like, I think I've seen it all, and then I just get giddy and delighted because I see something even cooler. And everyone is so nice, so thank you. And thanks for going on with all of the, you know, making sure that you're masked and vaccinated and tested and all that. It means a lot that you guys want to be here and that you're willing to, to uh, you know, deal with all the stuff we have to deal with right now. So thanks. What, what was the wildest, coolest thing that you saw this weekend? Anything jumped out in your mind? Um, did you guys, who saw the six foot tall baby Yoda? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how I feel about it. <laughs> well, no, I do know how I feel about it. I don't, it, it frightens me. <laughs> that was cool and weird. And then there was also a guy who I saw yesterday. I don't know what he was, but he was, he looked naked. He was just wearing like a, a flesh colored, you know, not even. Speedo. Thank you, yes, Speedo. Um, it was like all bloody and he was carrying a chainsaw. So I guess he was like someone who, got drunk and chainsawed himself. I don't even know. That wasn't a costume. Yeah. I've yeah. <laughs> just been out partying too late. Well, I want to get into some Star Wars with you for a little bit and maybe get to know your fandom because uh, this is a fan convention. So uh, what is, what's your earliest memory with Star Wars or maybe a favorite memory that you have? Um, I don't remember a time when there wasn't Star Wars because I, I grew up during the period when the first three movies were, were coming out. So I remember playing Ewok adventures in my backyard and having my little stuffed Ewok and of course wanting to be Princess Leia because every little girl did. Um, so it, it just like, it, it was just part of life. It, it, there wasn't ever like a moment when I was introduced to it because I think I saw it so young because I had an older brother so he saw it even sooner than I did. And, and uh, it was just part of my, my childhood. It's just one of those things. A question I love to ask people is, do you have a favorite kind of secondary character? So not not your Leia's or Luke's or Han's, but mm -hmm. someone that you think you might be the biggest fan of in the world. Oh, I don't think I could claim to be the biggest fan of, I mean, I've met too many Star Wars fans to so think I could be one of the biggest fans. Um, secondary character. Who count? I feel like everyone's an important character, though. That's true. Yeah. Well, in, in the panel the other day, we kept talking about Werner Herzog, and I'm still completely obsessed with him. Um, and I don't know what the line is between him as a person and him as a character. So that, I'm going to stick with them. I think that's a good one. I've never yeah. that. Uh, so Star Wars has a bunch of great catchphrases. May the Force do with you. I've got a bad feeling about this. And now everyone is talking about this is the way. It's bonkers! So how does it feel to be the first character to have said this is the way? Insane! It's so, I mean, it's the coolest thing ever. I've never had a catchphrase. And I feel like, you know, a lot of people get unlucky and they have a catchphrase that's really annoying. And I never get sick of it. Um, I mean, people, you know, sometimes they're like, would you mind writing it on my picture, on my Funko Pop? And I'm like, I feel incomplete if I don't write it. And I also really appreciate that it is a very useful phrase. It can be applied to a lot of situations. Uh, my brother tries to use it in his parenting. I try to use it with my husband. And after he saw the, uh, that fight with the stormtroopers, he, he listens to it better. <laughs> um, so it, yeah, it, it's ridiculous. I just, I can't, words cannot explain how cool it feels. Was that something that you or the, the crew knew was gonna catch on, or, or did that surprise everybody? The whole thing, I, I'm somebody who keeps my expectations pretty low, and not because I try to be cynical, but just because there is a lot of, you know, I've been a part of so many projects that I think are really good and have great people and great ideas involved, and they just don't catch on. Um, there's so much that goes into it, timing and 
the context into which something is released, like what else is coming out at the same time, and you know the people involved. And um, so, no, I definitely didn't. I mean, it. I had to say that in my audition, and even then, it sort of gave me chills. Um, I sort of recognized the the gravity and the profoundness of it, but no, I had no idea it was going to catch on the way that it did. That's kind of part of the Mandalorian creed, I guess, the way of the Mandalore, mm -hmm. uh, keeping your mask on and everything. If you personally had to add something that you wanted into the Mandalorian creed, what would it be? Um, and keep good hygiene, because I feel like it gets really smelly. <laughs> <laughs> Under the armor. I have at a convention I did recently, there was a, a gentleman who makes soaps, and there was one that he made that's called Mandalorian Armor. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, exactly. And um, Joey Fatone was there at that convention, and, and he looked at it and he said, This must smell like ball sweat. <laughs> and it didn't, it smelled really good. It's like freshly washed Mandalorian armor. <laughs> but yeah, that's always, that's always been a. a practical question. That was one of the first things my, my mom started. My mom has a very scientific mind and she she's always poking holes in things and so she was like, well they have to take off their helmets when they eat and they, you know, how do they take baths and how do they procreate and all that stuff. And I think there's been lots of creative answers to that. <laughs> Your mom's a real Star Wars fan asking all these questions. Yeah. It's, it's perfect. So you, you, we were actually just talking about your mom figuring out the melting point of Beskar. Can you yeah. talk a little bit about that? <laughs> so, was there anyone who was in the panel a couple days ago? What, I don't even know what day it is. It's Monday. That was Friday. And um, is the gentleman who asked me about the Beskar here? No, he's not. So, oh, okay. Um, so, he was being very clever and he asked me what the melting point of Beskar is and I fortunately came up with my own clever answer and I said, well, it depends on, you know, are we talking about within the atmosphere of Mandalore? Are we on Tatooine? Are we on Navarro? What unit of measurement are we using? And so I avoided answering it. But my mom, my mom was here this weekend for her first convention um, and she, and she had a great time. So thank you to everyone who was so nice to her. So she, she said, well, you know, Beskar is strong enough to withstand a lightsaber, so that means that the melting point has to be higher than the heat of a lightsaber. So she looked up the heat of a lightsaber, which is 36,559.13 degrees Fahrenheit. So the melting point of Beskar must be at least 36,559.14 degrees Fahrenheit. So we have, we're a little bit closer to the answer. <laughs> What's a, I mean, I'm sure you get asked this all the time, but I have to know, what's it like to wear the helmet and the, the whole get up? Um, it, it's, it's really quite awkward. Um, it's, and this helmet, by the way, is not my actual helmet from the show. There's, there's no way Disney would let me just carry it around with me. Um, this is made by uh, a guy named JC, whose company is Galaxy Props, and he's in the vendor hall, and you can buy one from him, and he is nice enough to loan it to me. Um, the helmet is, um, it, it, it's very limiting, the vision is very limited, you can't see peripherally, you can't see down, it's really snug because they do all of, they record all the dialogue while we're shooting, it's not added in later, they make changes later, but it's all done at the same time as we're, we're shooting the scenes. Um, and uh, it's very constrictive and it was, it was such an interesting, yeah, I feel like as an actor, one of the things that's helped me the most is just trusting that like every single challenge, every single obstacle, everything that seems like it's gonna be a hindrance with like technical stuff is something that I can use for the character. And so one of the reasons I think that uh, the armorer developed very like steady, slow, um, not to, uh, like in real life, you may have noticed, I gesture a lot, I like use my hands all the time, I use my face, and, and she is much more still. And part of that is because I didn't want to make any sudden moves because I was afraid I was going to trip on something and fall on my face. And there was, in fact, a lot of, like, keep, I, I've said this a number of times, that I just really want them to release a bloopers reel from season one because there were so many moments where 
when a bunch of Mandalorians were in the room together, we would like bonk helmets, we would run into each other. It's like a Three Stooges sketch. Completely different from what you get to see. Um, and so there was like, I had to have a great deal of trust that it looked as good as I, as I, as I knew it looked from the outside, because it didn't feel that way. But it was really helpful for the, the character because it made me, like I just had to trust that I wasn't gonna trip on something or fall over something. Um, and I couldn't, we learned pretty quickly that any sort of like, when you're wearing that helmet, um, you can't like look down and check where you're going because it's really distracting. Because when you don't have someone's face to look at, you just pay attention to every single movement of the rest of their body that much more. And everything means so much more. So every slight movement um, was, had a big impact and sometimes that would be really distracting. And that was so much fun for me as an actor to learn the language of that movement. And we were all sort of learning it together as we shot, we were shooting episode one and episode three at the same time with um, Deborah Chow and Dave Filoni. And we were just like trying things and getting feedback in real time. And it was a really fun challenge. I enjoyed it. And I, I did have mass training from doing theater work and I never in a million years thought that I would make use of it for television or you know, for Star Wars. <laughs> so that's nice. <laughs> what was it like to read the script for chapter eight? Because I remember watching that and being pretty disappointed because I felt like we were being set up for like, oh, a noble sacrifice, the armor is gonna buy them some time and uh, probably not make it out. Yeah. And then you have that badass fight scene. You um, were being set up for that. John exactly. told me that he had originally written it that she did sacrifice herself and that was the end of the armor and then he changed his mind. I was like, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I thought it was incredible and I got that script and I was like, okay, I am gonna, I went to Ryan, our stunt coordinator, and I was like, I wanna train, I wanna do this. And we were shooting it in like two or three weeks. And so he, he very gently and very kindly, he said, that's really sweet. He said, there's just no way that you could learn the level of, of fighting that you need to like make this go well. Um, but I did, he said, see what you can pick up. And I did work with somebody for about, for the two or three weeks that I had. and. Um, it was all based in a, a martial art called Kali, and that was really fun for me because I love getting to learn new things as an actor, and I've always wanted to like be able to train for something. Um, and so I did did that so that I could do some of the transitions and stuff, but Lauren Mary Kim, my amazing stunt double, was the one who did that fight in actuality. And for me, I, I knew the fight happened, but I didn't see it until the episode aired and everybody else was watching it, and so it, I think had a similar impact on me as it had on everybody else. And I was just, I was like, thank you, Lauren Mary Kim, because you made that character look way better than Emily would have if she had tried to do that fight. <laughs> so it was a pretty, pretty uh, breathtaking moment. And I, I mean, I cheered like, like I guess a lot of you did. Yeah, yeah it was. Um, well, now I'm gonna ask you something you probably can't answer, but I feel like I have to ask. I mean, the armor is still alive, so. Where was she during season two? Good question. I don't know. <laughs> and it was so bizarre because, like, I, I'm, I'm sure you've heard a million times that, like, they keep things very secret. And um, and we, even as actors, Ryan, who who I'm working with this week, it was people come up to my table and, and keep asking, like, am I going to be in season three? Am I going to be in season three? And he said, here's what happens. A van pulls up to her house. <laughs> they throw a burlap sack over her head. They shove her in the van. They drive her to set, she gets out. John Favreau says, say the line, say the line. And I say, this is the way. They throw the bag over my head again and they take me home. And that's a little bit what it feels like. Like I, I did not know for sure that I wasn't going to be in season two until I did the math and I was like, oh, okay, they're done shooting season two. I guess I'm not in season two. Um, and then it was, it was bizarre because when the trailer was about to come out, they got in touch with my agent and they said, Emily's probably gonna get a lot of questions when the trailer comes out, so just tell her not to say anything. And I was like, well, that's easy because I don't know anything. <laughs> um, and then the day the trailer came out, I, I hadn't seen it, but my phone just started blowing up. And so I watched it and I realized that like I was the voice of season two. And I was like, oh, okay, now I understand, but why am I not in it? <laughs> Like when the um, oh, with the Aqualish, is that those the characters that showed up in the Armorer's Forge? 
Um, when I saw that, I was like, what the heck? Where is she? So I don't know. I don't know where she went. But she's around somewhere. She's not dead. Do you have any head cannon? Like, what, where do you see her in your mind? What's she off doing? Well, I think she's off trying to get into contact with other Mandalorians um, to rebuild, because that's what they just have to keep doing, right? I think so. Yeah. That feels like where season three and beyond are probably going to head. Uh, do you feel like the Mandalorian would mesh well with someone like Bo Katan and these other Mandalorians who are running around with their masks off, not a care in the world? Do you mean to have with the armorer mesh well? I would be really interested to see her, her reaction to it. Because um, she's not, I, 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 I'm so intrigued by her. Um, because she is so, you know, she. one of the things I love about her is that she believes so deeply in this creed and it is just, to see somebody who has such conviction as that and who is not, um, you know, she's not aggressive about it except when she needs to be. She's not, uh, she's not like shouting it at people, trying to force them to believe it. It's just like something that she carries in the core of her being. So I'd be interested to see what her reaction would be. Because I don't think that she would like immediately fly off the handle. Um, and I do think that she is interested in deeper understanding amongst all the Mandalorians. But this is the way not to take off your, your helmet. So I don't know, I'd be really intrigued. Also because I think Katie Sackhoff is amazing and I just want to get to work with her. Yeah. Woo -hoo! I think you all can see that. <laughs> um, do you know if the armor has a name? The Mandalorian is an interesting show with a lot of characters like <laughs> Okay, I have uh, one more question for Emily, but uh, we want to make sure there's plenty of time for audience Q&A. So if you want to line up right here, uh, we will get a microphone to you. Um, so, we left off with a lot of the Mandalorian characters and the Dark Saber. Who do you think is more worthy of wielding the Dark Saber, Din or Bo Katan, or would you like to throw the armors after the ring? Oh my gosh! The Dark Saber. So I just got a Dark Saber from a company called CR Sabers, maybe? I might be getting that wrong. And it's so fun. And it's one of the ones that you can actually fight with, like it won't break. Um, and it makes fun noises and everything. Uh, but that was not the question. <laughs> um, I'm getting so many fun toys. Um, oh man, I love the dilemma that they've set up because, like, Din Djarin, he, it doesn't feel like he wants the Darksaber. He's a very reluctant leader. Um, I think Bo Katan would like to have it back, but also knows that, you know, that, like, that there's a little bit of shadiness with the way that she had it and the way she lost it. Um, I don't feel like the armorer would want to wield it like to be the leader. She doesn't, she strikes me as the one who like sort of leads the leaders and supports the leaders. You know, she's the mentor. Um, but I think that it's gonna, I mean, I can't wait to see how they resolve that because uh, they've set up something that's really sticky. And um, I don't know, who do you guys want to see? ultimately have the dark saber. Mm. Oh, that's gonna start a whole <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. How long do we have? <laughs> and, and sorry, let's just uh, you guys are pretty good, but let's just keep social distance though. Why is everyone on the floor? Why are you guys all kneeling? This is the way. Oh, well, that's so considerate of you. <laughs> on set because obviously there's stunt doubles and mm -hmm. you guys work with stunt doubles even when you are in the armor and stuff like that so how much I guess is added in later like because obviously when 80% of the cast doesn't show their face yeah it's very easy to transition from shot to shot like that and I've seen a lot of interviews with people who say that when you do show their face it's a lot more difficult so how much of the show is you guys versus your stunt doubles and um, is, do you reshoot scenes with both, or how, how does that work logistically? It varies from character to character. The armor, I am always the armorer, except in that one fight sequence. Um, with Din Djarin, there are three main guys that do that. I mean, we all know Pedro, and I think everyone by now knows about uh, Brendan Wayne and Latif, um, I don't remember Latif's last name, who are just such 
such phenomenal people, and it truly is. I mean, I love, I had worked with Pedro before, and I think Pedro is brilliant, I think Brendan is brilliant, I think Latif is brilliant, and they all bring something different to Mando, and what you see and what you love is all of their contributions, plus a couple of other people. Um, because Mando is, I mean, and I can only really speak to season one when I was there, um, but you know, Mando is in so much and sometimes he's just doing action, and so it's easier just to get one of the stunt doubles to do that. But that that's no small thing, because that means that everyone who is contributing to playing Mando has to have the same body movements, has to have the same, um, you know, you have to, because you're gonna notice if it's not him, especially by now, we know him really well. Um, and I don't really know about other characters, I do know uh, one thing that was interesting when we were shooting season one was that they still hadn't decided if uh, Grogu was going to be a puppet or CGI. And so every time we shot a scene with him, we did a scene with the puppet, and then we did a scene where there was nothing there so that they could CGI it in later. Yeah. Um, and thank goodness, I'm so glad that, that Werner, it sounds like he was the one that bullied them into using the puppet. I'm so glad for that. Right? <laughs> Like what feels like the original Star Wars is having the puppet that, and I think that in some ways that feels more real than, even if the CGI looked technically great, eh, the puppet's better. And knowing that there's somebody controlling the puppet, like that becomes part of that character. Um, so that was interesting, and, and it was, and as an actor, it's, you know, it's funny because we, we talk about how challenging it is to like do stuff with blue screen and green screen, and it's true, but it's also, just like going back to when you were six years old and you know, for me playing Ewok adventures in my backyard. I didn't have Ewoks, but I saw them there. They were there. Um, so sometimes we have to kind of call on that brain again when we do that, but it, it was much more fun to do the scenes with the puppet who reduces you to idiocy. <laughs> you, know, you know it's a puppet, but still just so cute. <laughs> Those scenes were a lot more fun than when there was nothing there. We were just like, oh, there is the child. <laughs> uh, that, that was a, that's a good question. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Thank you so much for spending your weekend with us. Oh, my pleasure. It's awesome to see you. So my question is, since your first time Dragon Connor, if you were to come back as a fan of anything, who oh. slash what would you be? Oh my gosh. That's a really good question. I hadn't thought about it at all. Um, <laughs> uh, my brain is exploding. I don't know. Um, Chewbacca. <laughs> I, I mean, I just like, every time I see a Chewbacca at a convention, it makes me so happy. And I was talking to, to one of the Chewbaccas here this weekend, a gentleman named Mickey, and he was saying that, like, you know, he was talking about the different Star Wars cosplay and, like, which ones bring the most happiness and and who gets excited and you know he's saying like you if, when you're Chewbacca you know people are going to be happy to see you and you're just bringing so much joy I think that would be fun yeah, yeah total anonymity and in a minute but never going to be yeah hi uh, so you were saying you know when you were a little girl you wanted to be Princess Leia like we all did and when we were growing up Princess Leia was kind of it for us girls yeah. who like Star Wars. And now there's lots of badass ladies in Star Wars, especially in Mandalorian. So I was wondering how that feels knowing that now there are little girls growing up with Star Wars who want to be your character and how that it, must be amazing. But <laughs> I mean, it may, I'm, I'm getting choked up. It makes me want to cry. It's incredible to me. Um, and I, I love, and one of the things that is most special about it too is that she is this, she's a strong woman. She has deeply held beliefs, um, which I think is so important to see modeled. And it, you know, people are very often like, oh, don't you wish like you could take off your helmet at least once, or da 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 da. But I, I have been doing this for a couple of decades now, and I, as a woman in Hollywood, am so aware of what I look like and what parts I'm you know, people think I'm right for, what parts they think I'm not right for, what I'm pretty enough for, what I'm not pretty enough for. And the fact that there is this character who is so beloved and it has nothing to do with what she looks like 
is incredible to me. I love that. And I love that, especially when I get to meet little girls who are wearing armor costumes. It just, it's so profound. Um, it is the most joyful feeling. I, I never imagined anything like this. And I'm just so grateful that they created a character like this. And I'm so grateful that I get to, to play her and that I get to learn from her too, because I always, I always learn from the characters that I play. And there's plenty that the armorer um, just owns that, that I kind of aspire to. So it's, it's unbelievable. Thank you for that question. I know, yeah, sorry. <laughs> erase, erase, erase. All right, since you said Chewbacca, we're gonna have to get a quick, quick uh, Chewbacca roar. And uh, I also wanna know, like, what was your reaction to the last episode, season two, when Luke five was oh in season three? Oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> Growing up as, I'm sure we all grew up as the Star Wars fans, I know my jaw dropped and- Yeah, I did I not it, expect like, five that. Times. It was bonkers, it was brilliant. It was insane. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I didn't expect that. I knew, especially because I knew nothing about season two at all. So it was, it was pretty rad. Yeah. And you wanted me to do a Chewbacca roar? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I never attempted it. Where like it's become this this 
so important to like you can you can even feel bad about yourself for not believing in yourself enough like you're supposed to summon that strength from yourself and like and we need each other um and that's okay and uh and so i'm i'm always grateful when someone reminds me that they like i don't have they, they just that they do it's just there they believe in me and it's not because i'm the best it's not because i'm trying my hardest necessarily it's just because i am worthy because i am here on this planet so that's always important to hear okay so i know how much you enjoy the fans because uh, obviously you are one yourself and uh, i i heard that you were at one of the five first legions uh get together as another movie uh helped out with the cast in uh, the first season uh, so I just wanted to know, like, how did you feel like taking photos with the Mandalorians yesterday and just the whole concept? There are so many who wanted on like the costumes and you know do things for people. It's, um, I, I mean, I'm just so I feel so lucky that that everyone has been so welcoming to me because I'm so new to the party. And um, I remember at the, I, I didn't know about any of the, I didn't know about the 501st, I didn't know about the Rebel Legion, I didn't know about the Mando Works, and, and we were the premiere for season one. There were a couple of, um, of uh, Mando Works chapters, is that what I would say? Um, clan. Clan, sorry, clans, I'm still learning. Um, at the premiere, and I was like, I, I remember like getting out of the car and seeing all these people with their own helmets, and I was like, what is this? And I, I mean, I continue to be amazed at the creativity that's within that particular group because of the, of, you know, people inventing their own characters. Um, and I also remember like one of the moments, I, I started to get an inkling of how special that, that community is during the premiere when, um, so we got to watch the first three episodes. And so in episode three, when like Mando's down for the count and all the bounty hunters are after him, and then, you know, the Mandalorians rise from below and, and start kicking ass, um, I, I, there was this tremendous cheer that came from all the mercs in the audience. And it was just so cool. They were, you know, they were so overjoyed to see um, the Mandalorians finally like get some, get some credit be legitimized um, and it's just been it's become one of my favorite parts of the conventions to get to know the local uh, of all of those different groups get to know the local clans and battalions and legions and um, and I am just so impressed by both the the diligence and the care that goes into making the costumes but also the incredible open-heartedness and all of the charity work that's done and all of the good that is happening in the world you know it's one thing to like dress up and and it's a great thing to dress up with your friends and celebrate like whatever fandom you're a part of. But I, I mean, it started when I was doing conventions for Supernatural. I've just seen how all these different fandoms, in addition to like loving each other so much because you have this shared appreciation for whatever show, like you, you turn that love outward and you share it with the rest of the world. And that is just incredible to me. So my amazement just keeps growing. It's been really cool. Thank you. And I've gotten to collect a bunch of amazing challenge coins and patches and <laughs> trade cards. Good morning. Hi. So you met, you mentioned you record all your dialogue live. You don't do AD, ADR. You say live. I live. do ADR, but oh. only like for things that need to be changed or something. You know, sometimes there's noise that gets in the way. What I was wondering was, do the helmets that are used for shooting, do they have wired up microphones? Yes. Like they do have them. Yeah. Okay. Which means that we can't have a fan in there, like a lot of you guys do. Oh. And it gets hot. <laughs> and that, man, I, just, I remember like especially shooting with uh, Tate, who plays Paz Vizsla, because he is a big guy. He's got a lot of armor on, and he would take off his helmet. We would, you know, we'd all take them off in between takes and have fans blowing on us and he was just covered in sweat. He needed some of that Mandalorian armor, so. Did you ever yell at any of them for taking their helmets off? I did not. <laughs> I was so rude. I think that would get old quickly. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, nice work. Hi, so in my own head camp, 
because Armour is still alive, he's probably off in some other planet creating her new covert of, of uh, Mandalore. Uh, what, I'm curious for you, for your perspective, what planet would you want to see the Armour on next, creating a new hidden face for Mandalore? Man. Well, I, it probably is not like the most educated answer, um, but I just think Tatooine looks like so much fun. <laughs> so for no reason other than that, I think it would be fun to be there, but I don't know if it really makes a lot of sense for her to try to rebuild there, but. Yeah, exactly. What's your what's your take? I'm curious to know. I, I was kind of thinking that something like a big city that you can hide in. So yeah, that's, see, that's a lot smarter. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, what would be the most fun? <laughs> yeah. new streaming platform like I knew it I'm really grateful for the way it all unfolded for me because it was it was pretty low-key like when I auditioned for it I knew it was something to do with Star Wars but it was so vague and my audition was just me in the room with the the casting associate there was like nobody from the show um, I was I was getting ready to get married. Like I was planning a wedding at the time. I was doing a play, so I was distracted by all these other things. So I just prepared for it like I would any other audition, and I do hundreds of auditions that amount to absolutely nothing. And then even when I got the call, my agent said, "So they want you to be a part of it. They're not quite sure how many episodes you'll be in. They're still trying to work out like how they're paying people because, because for the most, they didn't really audition that." Many. They mostly like offered stuff to these amazing, you know, big name actors. And so the rest of us, like random people, they were like, we don't really know what to do with you. Um, and uh, so I, I didn't really have much to share. And I even, I shot everything for my character before the show was even announced publicly, which was great because I think if I, if I know like what a frenzy was going to be created around it, what the anticipation was gonna be like, I would have been way more nervous. <laughs> and, uh, and I was already nervous enough because I'm working with John Favreau and Dave Filoni and I know their reputation and it's Star Wars! Um, so I was really grateful for that. And, uh, and it, it, you know, it's, in some ways I love that I'm, that I know, you know, still know very little about how much I'll be involved because I, uh, as a fan of different things, like being surprised. And so when people ask me things, I'm kind of glad that I can't, I can't reveal anything, I can't give any spoilers, because I think it makes the experience more fun to watch it. Yeah. We all know that uh, Lucasfilm always was in the forefront of visual uh, effects. Um, and you were one of the first who started working on this much cube. Um, the, 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 the volume. New volume. Mm -hmm. And um, the question is how much of the forge, how much of the surrounding was real for you? All what of it. was the experience like there and what was the experience while working in the volume? I did not work in the volume. I saw work happening in the volume, but all of the armor stuff, they built a room that was that forge and they you know, so they would have to take out pieces of walls depending on what they were shooting. And it was all practical. The, I mean, there was CGI for the like the flames and some of the. Um, I remember having a liquid that I was dipping something into, um, but it was all practical, which which was great in and of itself. I was sort of jealous that I didn't get to work on the volume because it looked so cool. And when you are inside it, like it truly, you you lose perspective on the unreality of it because it looks so real. Um, it's it's just magnificent, but uh, but I got to have everything there for my my little armorer's forge, and and I was grateful for that too because it's nice it's nice to have the actual stuff. Yeah, it helps. Thanks. 
Hey there. Uh, uh, I was uh, I, I was wondering what you thought about uh, Gina Carano leaving the show or being told that we're being told that she was. And when are we going to see uh, Disney and everybody else just just relax and chill out? <laughs> I wish I knew the answer to that. Allowing us to just enjoy yeah. the suspension of belief, you know, and enjoy the show. I'm not real concerned about what somebody is going to believe that that's why. Yeah, I, I, I feel you. All I can say is that Gina, in working with her personally, what impressed me about her from the beginning is that she is so interested in other people's opinions so welcoming of other people's opinions and wants to have a genuine dialogue. I mean, she's just like that in her day-to-day -day life. On set, she's more curious about the other people. She's very giving, she's very gracious. Um, I am thoroughly baffled by a lot of what we're dealing with right now with cancel culture, and I think that it's, oh man, you know, there's so many, so many layers to it that are important to look at, but I think that the, the, hatred that comes into it and the when people just start refusing to listen to the other side no matter you know which side you're on i think that that's really dangerous one of the things that is so beautiful about our country is that we have free speech and we can hear things that we don't like and we can disagree and that's fine um yeah no i, I mean i know so little about like the what happened, I just, I experienced it like you did. I don't know anything about the inner workings of it, and so I can only speak about Gina being a lovely person. Yeah. She is, yeah. Thanks. Now your accent, because clearly you and the armor don't share the same accent. Did you audition with like a different accent, or did you work through them, like people came up more like, let's try this sort of accent, or versus this when you were on set, or? Yeah, I, uh, it happened in the audition because apparently, and this is another reason why I'm like, how did I end up here? I'm so lucky. Apparently they were, so I did the scenes a few times in the audition and then the casting associate, Jason, he said, uh, okay, now we've mostly been seeing British women in their 50s and 60s for this, so do a British accent. <laughs> so like, I don't even know how I, you know, I'm not British, I'm not in my 50s or 60s, I made it into that room. Um, and I, it, I think it wound up sticking because it, John liked that it, uh, that it set her apart and made her just like on a different <laughs> level from everyone else. And it's delightful for me. It's sort of personally satisfying because you know there's lots of Brits that come and do brilliant American accents. And so now I get to go the other way. So that's <laughs> fun. <laughs> <laughs> How do you feel about seeing uh, Arbor Merchandising and Toys R Us the action figures of yourself? I do now, only because people have given them to me. Because, because it's so, I was like, like I didn't even find out I had an action figure till till uh, a friend like sent me a link. No, nope, nobody like official in any official capacity tells me any of this. I have nothing to do with the merchandising. Um, and uh, and I even reached out to Hasbro. I messaged them on Instagram. I was like, hey, do you think I could get one? And I never got a response. So. <laughs> yeah. So I had my uh, a friend of mine bought me one of the first ones, and then somebody at this convention brought me a Black Series one, which I am so excited about. And um, Sideshow, the company that that does hot hot toys, yeah. hot toys is that yeah. Um, they just released the like one six scale armor, and they they did send me one, um, and they sent me this super dope armor ring. This is, this is the way. And then I also keep cutting myself with because she has spikes on her helmet and it, they're sharp. Um, so that's very humbling. Uh, but it's I, I, I keep finding about finding out about new things. Somebody brought me a keychain that they'd gotten at Walmart yesterday. I didn't know that existed. So uh, somebody showed me some Adidas sneakers that have the armor on them and I I am just continually delighted and amazed. It's super fun. And your Lego. And yeah, the, Le the Lego, the Lego Forge. What the heck? <laughs> so cool. I want to play with it all. 
Hello, thank you for being here. Um, I was just wondering, I know it's kind of early. Um, I don't know if you'd have any idea if you'd be back maybe next year. This is my first opportunity to see you. The one thing that I always hate about DragonCon is you just cannot get to see, there's so much going on. Oh my gosh, on. right? It's just frustrating. Um, yeah. you know, you so you're already planning for next year. Well, uh, I, yeah. you know, not to get too transparent, my, since my wife passed away about 11 years ago, it's been, It's okay, take whatever time you need. It's okay. Anyway, that means a lot to come to you. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that with us. And I, I don't know if I'll be back here next year. I would like to be, so whoever's listening from Dragon Con. <laughs> want me here, I guess tell them you want me here. Woo <laughs> uh, but I, I mean, you're busy, so. Uh, my question is, I was hearing you talk about theater as well. Do you prefer theater over film? Uh, and then the follow-up question is, who would be your dream co-star in theater and in film? Oh. Um, it, ooh, it, I prefer theater in like in the actual acting process like um because i love the collaboration i love just being in a rehearsal room with a bunch of actors for a long time i love discovering the piece together um and i love having the audience there that's one of the things i miss the most when i'm doing anything for the cameras you don't you you're surrounded by people but they're not allowed to react they all have to be quiet and that's bizarre um, and so you don't know, especially like with comedy, if anything's landing. And, uh, and that's one of my, one of the reasons also that I love the convention so much because I get to finally like be with the audience and, um, and hear your guys' reactions and, and learn so much from you. Um, so in the moment, I love the experience of theater. Um, but I also love like getting to see the end product when I do, I mean, you know, you couldn't do, you could do a really interesting version of The Mandalorian on stage, but it would never look like it. Mandalorian the musical. It's <laughs> probably well, that would be awesome. Do you think they'll do a, an, a musical episode in season three? Yeah! Okay, I mean, the armor is always talking about, like, the songs of Eon's past, so... <laughs> Um, oh boy. <laughs> well, obviously there would be a song called This Is The Way. It would be like the 11 o'clock number. Um, so, yeah, I love them both for such different reasons. I've already gotten to work with my dream co-star on stage, um, an actor named Mark Rylance, who uh, has also done a lot of movies as well, and he's, he's won some Tony Awards and an Oscar, you know, he's not right. Um, so that was really cool. Um, and I have, I have, I have, ooh, I can't name a dream person I want to work with on screen because I, I get, I get sort of weird about like saying those things sometimes because I don't want to, I just want to keep it here. It feels scary to put it out there. Also because, you know, there have been plenty of things, plenty of people that I've been like, oh, it would be amazing to work with that person. And then I wind up working with someone that I didn't think of and was equally amazing. Um, so I like the surprise of it. But thank you for that question, wherever you went. Oh, there you're back there. Hello, how are you doing? Nice to meet you. Um, I love your voice in The Mandalorian. It's very, like, great voice acting and just, like, your thank performance you. on the show is amazing. I play Star Wars Galaxy of Heroes with a mobile uh, uh, game platform. Mm -hmm. And in that game, your character, the armorer, it is pretty powerful, like they can help other people to become more OP. My question is, in future episodes of uh, the Mount Pendler or any other Star Wars series, will we be able to get a chance to see you kick more ass in the show? I love that you like put so much description before the question that I can't answer. You're like setting up, you're like, maybe if I say a whole bunch of things before I ask her, she won't notice. And she'll just slip and she'll answer it. 
Well played, sir. I don't know. That was very skillful. Uh, thank you. Um, first of all, uh, I just want to I just want to say I'm, I'm incredibly jealous of you because you got to be on. Uh, thank the maker with Ryan Key and those oh, other yeah. two guys who aren't Ryan Key. They're from my hometown. Oh, oh really? Cool. Um, my question, though, has nothing to do with that. Uh, <laughs> Great. <laughs> Are um, you going to ask me what that guy just asked? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, this is one you hopefully can't do. Um, what's your favorite role that you've done aside from the armor? Oh, I don't have one favorite. Since I was just talking about working with Mark Rylance, um, the and it's something that none of you know anything about because that this is also the bummer about theaters like hardly anyone gets to see it. Um, but it was a play that we that had been newly written and we were sort of creating it as we were rehearsing it. And I was this character who was based on the Norse goddess Freya, but I lived in um, a sauna hut on a frozen lake in Wisconsin, um, and I learned a lot about the culture of ice fishing, which I didn't know anything about. I got to go ice fishing, but the premise of this play was that there were these two guys, they sort of like a waiting for Godot on a frozen lake, and these two guys are ice fishing, and then they run into these Norse gods who are like in hiding on a frozen lake in Wisconsin, because that's where you go. And, um, and Freya was this wonderful catastrophe of a woman who like truly, she, you know, she had so much love and she wanted to make everybody so happy and she was so well-intentioned and so, so just unskilled in the execution and caused a lot of messes. And that was so much fun. And like every night I had to do, every night I had to give a toast um, and I was allowed to write the toast every night and my sole goal was to get my castmates to laugh and trying to write, and so I decided that, you know, there's this Norse goddess, she hasn't spent a lot of time on Earth. Um, sort of like Amara, I guess, from Supernatural. It's like, she's new to Earth, she's learning about the humans. So I was like, what would she use as a toast? So she would like pull from like 80s rock songs and like nursery rhymes, and, um, and it would just be the most bizarre combination of things, and it was so much fun when I got my, my castmates to laugh. But I, I love that when you get to work with actors who are just so in the moment, you get to improvise and you come up with magic that, like, just comes out of nowhere. So that that was my one of my favorites for sure. Yeah. I was wondering if you could tell us how different it was filming for Disney versus Supernatural. Well, um, I'll first I'll tell you what was similar, which was that both casts and crew were phenomenal. Um, just such skilled actors and, and craftspeople, but also such generous and gracious and collaborative um, artists. And that was, that was so special about both experiences. Um, the difference is definitely there, I mean, you know, you can feel that there's a lot at stake with Star Wars because there's, because it's Star Wars and there's so much money and so much going on technically, but what really impressed me is that even, even with that, there was never, there wasn't a lot of stress. And I feel like John um, just created such a, a playful, imaginative atmosphere where we were all, we all felt free to try and fail because you have to fail if you like keep playing it safe you're not gonna make anything brilliant um, but you have to have the space to do that when there's a lot of like I've been parts of things I've been a part of things that you know they move very quickly they got to stay on budget they got to do this that and the other and so you don't feel like you're you're worried about like messing up which is the worst feeling when you're doing anything creative um, so I was grateful for that um, Supernatural uh, is just so goofy um, I mean, all, all of the stories that you hear are true. It's so fun. Um, it is unfortunate that Jared and Jensen are so ugly, but other than that, <laughs> you know, we all work with what we have. Other than that, they're pretty fun, and it's good that they, they have good personalities to make up for that. <laughs> yeah, I've just been stupidly blessed to get to work on 
such good shows with such good people. Yeah. Uh, so I was wondering, I don't know if you both always have to decide these things, but as you were doing it, did you feel like the armorer um, took in orphans because of her belief? So do you, did you play that as any sort of maternal thoughts to it? That's a really interesting question. Um, huh, I've never thought about this distinction between those two things. Um, I think, I mean, I think that it is the creed, so it, you know, it, it, it is the way. Um, so she would just do it, but I do think that, and one of the things I like about her is that there's a, a maternal quality to her. Um, so I think it's a little bit of both. Um, and I think that, I think that that energy is so important for this very, you know, these, these Mandalorians are warriors and it's easy to draw upon that energy, the fighting spirit and the, the bravery that has to go with that. And I think that it's vital to have the energy that she provides too, that is a little more maternal and, and nurturing in her own way. She's, she's not like a soft and sweet and cuddly mom, um, but she is a strong presence that way. Yeah, thank you. We, we are just about out of time. We have two minutes left and I did just think of a good one, so I'm gonna sneak one in right at the end. All right. Uh, what, what do you think the armor how do you think the armor would feel about Din's actions at the end of season two with revealing himself in front of everyone? I'm as curious to know as you, because you know she did tell him that that basically he had to do everything in his power to protect this um, this foundling that he has been entrusted with. They're a clan of two, so I don't know. I don't know where that line is. You know, do the ends justify the means? Um, I would be really interested to find out what, what her reaction would be, because I, I, think, I think she would try to understand, but I don't know that that means that she would be okay with it. I don't know. It's, I like that they set up that dilemma. Yeah, that thanks. is basically perfect timing. Uh, Great. Guys, thank you. shuts down. <laughs> photo ops at 12 something and I have photos with Omi who plays um, Dr. Pershing so come be in a picture with us in the helmet and maybe even the hammer and his Dr. Pershing glasses because it's fun. <laughs> and definitely go see your own wall of fame. Thank you yeah. so much for being here. Have a great Monday.